and welcome back. Now let's take a look at some C syntax to actually teach you more about the language that we haven't already. So the first is, we talked about before that there's uh, a new way in C99 to have a Boolean type, but if you don't include that, you just had to go with kind of more ANSI C, what is true and what's false? So what's false in C is zero, only zero. Zero is false, that's it. Turns out null is actually defined as zero. So if you say a pointer, I got a pointer here, and if you set the pointer to null, which means it's not set to any, pointing to anything, that really means the pointer is set to zero. Um, and I mentioned before that standard bool.h defines official Boolean types, you want to use that. What's true? Everything else. This is a little different than Python, because Python has kind of what, what, what false is for every type. So an empty string is false for strings, zero is false for numbers, uh, you know, empty sequence is false for other things, um, and anything that's not that is true. In Scheme, it's actually closer to what C does, because Scheme actually has hashtag f is false and everything else. Even zero is true for Scheme. Even M, this is actually, a, a, this is actually a, a matter of debate. You want to get a Scheme person riled up? Ask them whether the empty list is true or false. Some people say it's not pound, hashtag f. Some people say, no, 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 empty list, it should be false also. So there's a lot of, ha, get, get two people who are you know, old Scheme folks together and have them fight over whether uh, nil, nil is, uh, is false or not. It's kind of a fun, fun game to do. So in terms of variables, you've got to have types. So you know from Java you have types. Uh, you have to declare what type of variable is before you use it, and you can't change it. It's locked in for the life of the program. Types can't change. So here's an example of some of the common types people are using. You saw uh, ints for integer numbers and negative numbers as well. You might say, well, how big are they? We'll show you in a slide how this is all ambiguous. And this is why we added in types, which declare exactly they are 8 bits wide or 16 bits wide, or et cetera, et cetera. Unsigned ints for unsigned numbers, floating point for floating, float for floating point numbers. We'll actually have a whole lecture on how, to, how that actually gets stored. That's a really cool lecture to see. Doubles for bigger floating point numbers, uh, characters for single characters, for you know, ASCII characters, uh, longs for longer ints. So I got an int, but I need, I need more space for, an, for a two's complement value. I do a long. I need more space than that. It's a long, long. It's like, let's just keep adding the word long in front of things. When they, it's almost like you save a file, you save a file, you're working with a, you know, a friend or something. Back in the days of sneakerware, when you had a file, you'd call it final, and then you give it to them, and they make a change. They call it final, final. It's like long, long. It's bigger than long, that's what it is. Um, Python versus Java versus C. So, um, interesting thing about C is C, they decide that int feels like the, the most efficient way you would store a two's complement number. So, if, here's an example. If it's a 32-bit machine, which means the data kind of is, the whole data path is meant for 32 bits, then probably int's gonna be 32. If it's a 64-bit machine built so that 64 bits are what all the, everything is floating around in that way, that's the width of the data path, then probably uh, ints are gonna be 64. It's really what's called the word size, which is the width of the majority of the data you're flowing with. Um, Here's what I don't like. I actually don't like this slide so much because you have to remember, I don't want you to memorize these things. I mean, the, the only guarantee is that a long, long is the size of, size of is, I'll, tell you, I'll show you in a second what size of does. It tells you how many bits wide this thing is. Um, actually, it's how many bytes wide this thing is. Sorry, how many bytes wide this thing is. Um, so if it's 32 bits, the size of will say four. Okay, just remember that. Okay. So the only guarantee is that size of a long, long is bigger than or equal to size of a long, bigger than or equal to size of an int, bigger than or equal to size of a short. But you don't know, other than that, they could all be 64. They could all, I mean, it's a little crazy. Um, I mean, I guess long has to be bigger than 32. I just don't like this. I'd like to use int types and declare, I, I need to know. I don't want to be, I don't want to be guessing. I don't want to have code that runs on one machine and I move to another machine and because of some way I understand things, it doesn't run anymore. No, I don't need to know how wide these things are. I think int types is what you should always be using. They could all be 64 bits, but I, I would prefer you and encourage you very strongly to use int types as much as you can. It gets a little annoying how you printf and scanf values with int types. is a little bit annoying if you use macros for that. Uh, not macros, but constants for that. It's a little annoying, but do it. It's cleaner, uh, and you'll have code that then migrates really cleanly. You'll have it work. So, which means you want to live in a 32-bit world? Live in a 32-bit world. If you move to 64, it won't just change size integer. It'll just be 32 because you said explicitly, I want this in to be 32 bits wide. Great. Um, Here's a little comparison about the three languages, Python, Java, and C, of the size of what an int is. Uh, Python, they're at least 32 bits. Java, they are exactly 32 bits, which is interesting. And C depends on the computer. In the early days, ints were 16. 
It was a big deal when ints became 32 because the machines back in the day had a data path at a word size that was 16 bits, it was two bytes wide. So C has changed and evolved, C's old language had that, and I don't like the idea that it changes. Use int types and lock it in. You can also, talk about lock, we're talking about locking things in, you can also lock in the value of variables. Um, if you have a variable that you know is gonna change, it's gonna be a constant, it's reference value, it's the golden ratio, it's the days in the week, it's, you know, it's the speed of light, it's the law. Lock that in and say constant. So if you add constant in front of it, it says the value won't change. If you try to change it, your compiler will say, hey, you can't change this const. Very useful. So compilers are like your friend in that way. So if you know something's not gonna change, lock it in as a value, as a const. An enum is a nice feature of the language. It lets you kind of have an enumeration. So enumerated constants. It gives you each a value. So if I say enum color, red's gonna be zero, color, green's gonna be one, and blue's gonna be two. If you ever use an enum, I strongly recommend you not peek under the hood to find out what those bits are of each one of those. I recommend you always not know. Your code should work, even if they were to rearrange the, the numbers of those guys. If I were to say, go back to your code and change to be blue, red, green, then each of those will be different values. Your code should still work. Type functions in C. So all the functions that you declare have to have a return type. Uh, they need to, you need to explicitly tell them in advance, usually above the function, what its expected return type is. And then when you're actually using it, you'll, oh, I get it. You're, it can match them up and try to do some kind of matching to say, well, you know what, you're, you told me it returns an int, but you're actually using it as an unsigned int. Are you sure you want to do that? And so it'll give you a warning or give you an error there, which is nice. You can also say, look, this is supposed to be a command. It's supposed to be something that's supposed to do, have a side effect. So the return value can be void, meaning return nothing. Um, and variables and functions need to be declared before they're used. Here's an example of number of people and, and dollars and cents is kind of declared as ints and a float. A struct is a way to make abstract data types. You can have a series of fields. This feels very much like Python, uh, where you have a, you know, a, a class and you have dot, dot fields. Same idea, but you have a lot more control about what the bit widths are of that uh, for the most part. Um, so the other thing I want to explain to you is type def allows you to declare a new type. So you know the types we talked about are floats and ints and et cetera and cares. You can make a new type. That's pretty cool. So I say, you know what? I want a byte. I know a byte's going to be eight bits. So I'm going to say u int eight underscore t as byte. And now I can just say byte b1 and b2. That's really cool. So that's really useful. Um, the way you can do it. A struct is to say, I have a structure, it's gonna have two parts to it. It's kind of like a ball of two pieces of data together. Here is uh, a song. What would a song be? Well, the, the length in seconds of how long the song is and the year it's recorded. That's a structure, two ends together. I call that a song and I type def it as a, as a song. And now I can just say song, song one. And that thing, that's gonna have two fields. How do you get to the fields? Dot notation, just like Python. So song one dot length in seconds, set that one. Song one dot year recorded, do the same thing for song two. So pretty cool, so structs are kind of cool. Um, we'll talk about them more a little bit later when we talk about pointers and how to access those fields. Again, most of this is from C and Java being the same. Within a function, it's remarkably close in terms of its syntax. Uh, if uh, looks very similar, you got an if but without an else, you got an if with an else, but that's it. You don't have an elif like you have in Python. Um, and you'll notice that sometimes you don't have to have, if you only have one statement, you don't have to have brackets around it. That's great, except when you think you've, it's indented, so you're thinking, well, it's Python, right? Because you're in Python mode, it's indented, it must be part of the if, and you don't put brackets, so you have one thing, that's right, but then you put a second thing. Turns out that second thing, even though it's indented, is not part of the if, because if without, without brackets only takes one statement after it, one semicolon, that's it. So you think it looks, and that's a huge source of bugs for new programmers, where I don't use the brackets, but I have two lines in there, and I think they're both you know, indented, so they're part of the if, they're not part of the if. You need to have brackets. So get used to always putting brackets around your if, even if you only have one, one line. I don't think we've done it always in this code that we're gonna share with you because we had to pack it tight in the slides, but try to do that. Just, in fact, most editors will actually add the brackets anyway for you. If you go into Sublime, it'll do it all for you. So get in the habit of putting the brackets around it. We also have while and do while. Do the statement while this expression is test. So if you wanna test it before test it before you go into the, the set, then that's the while. If you wanna do it before you do the test, test, test after, use the do. It's kinda cool. Four looks very similar for initialization, a check and an update, then a statement. You have a switch statement which says, here's an expression and then I have this cases and if the cases match, you do these statements. And here's the problem. You have to have a break statement after each of the cases. So case, uh, case, it's uh, uh, one. Hey, maybe it's switch on a letter. You type in some letter. 
Case Q, because they want to quit. Well, then do, sorry, you want to quit. Sorry, you want, please, you want to come back? If you don't have a break a line below that last case, it'll roll into the next case statement. You have to have a break after each of these cases in there. So that's actually important. People have done this before where they'll just roll through. Like, why is it running both of them? Yeah, because it's case kind of jumps into it and then it just rolls until it sees a break. And that's a problem. Um, there is a default that says, like, it's everything else but the cases I've cases, but the cases I've checked is the default case. C also has a strange syntax called a go-to. Do not use a go-to, at least in 61C. Go-to is reserved for kind of expert C programmers who know what they're doing. You can basically make C look like basic, where you go here, and you have all these labels, and you can go there, and go there, and go there, and it's, 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 it's non-local control flow. Right? It means jump around, just randomly. Don't do that. <laughs> it's like the worst code you'll ever have. So don't use a go-to until you get to have, like, until you upgrade to badge level 17 of the badges you've earned for programming in C. It's bad, it's a bad case, but it has a go-to. So you might see some go-tos in some code that you might inherit. We're gonna end this, this lecture with a, a look at actual C code. Stop talking to me about the format. Actually show me how this works. Well, let's read it together. And in fact, I have, I think I have this set to be a pen. Check this out. So I can actually highlight each of these lines and we can talk about them. So you saw the easiest of my includes of that. That's nothing new before. Let me make this white just to, just to give you some juice here. All right. So we declare some, we declare some values at angle degree. This is, this is kind of old school ANSI style because I'm declaring it at the top before I actually really use it. I could have declared it just at the moment. I literally could have declared it int. I could have said int right here in front of angle degree and I wouldn't have had to do any more than that. So a lot of people declare it locally rather than here, but this is like more old school style to do this. Let me clear that up. So we're computer, ta computer table of, pri of, sign, of sign function. Okay, so first here's pi. Pi is gonna be a double. That means it's a float, but it's a little bit more space than that. We'll talk about the details in a, a slide in a lecture or two. Um, I set a, a, a tan. A tan is in math.h. So I could just get access to that. You may be like, well, Dan, you mean in Python, I used to have this dot notation. If I import math, I have to say math.atan. Nope, all of those in the same shared namespace. Welcome to one namespace. Have a good time. <laughs> um, I'm gonna print this out, print what pi is. I'm gonna print out this little table header. That's, that's nothing special there. Uh, and now here's my first, here's my first actual uh, control structure. While angle degree is less than or equal to 360, that's fine. Um, you never, this is like an FYI, I'm going rogue a little bit, you never wanna have one of these test cases be based on a floating point value, because the floating point value sometimes can be 0.001, sometimes 0.99999, and that means the number of iterations can actually be off by one. So you always wanna have kind of a while loop, be checking on an integer value, not a floating point value. This is an important thing. So I'm doing this while, which is on angle degree, and angle degree is an int. So yay, thumbs up on that one. Say what the angle radian is, a little expression, say what the value is, call sign. I print this out, the value of angle degree and value. I increment angle degree and I stay in my loop until I'm done, return zero. So pretty simple piece of code, but that's an actual working piece of code. You can copy and paste this and have it run and print a little sign tables. In fact, there's my sign table. That's what you get. There's a little pi and some little angles and signs kind of nice and it goes on until 360 degrees, all right? That C, we're a little lot more, but we're kind of getting our hands dirty. I love it. Enjoy. By the way, grab, you better be, if, you have been, if you've been watching up to now, you better go grab your editor and copy this stuff in. Come on, I told you that. Let's have some fun. We'll see you in the next video.